Hi, pilots. A quick note before today's podcast, you may notice a new name for this podcast. Fast Five is now Pilot's Discretion. It's the same format, the same great guests, but with a new name that we hope is easier to understand and one that's distinct from our very popular Saturday morning email newsletter at Sporties. So with that, on to the podcast. On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, we're talking about aviation maintenance for the modern pilot with a IA Mike Bush. He explains what reliability-centered maintenance means, the two keys to piston engine longevity, and why the lean-of-peak debate has lasted so long. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, everyone. I'm John Zimmerman of Sporties, and today we are very fortunate to have Mike Bush joining us on the podcast. He stays very busy uh, as an author, a speaker, podcaster, and a pilot, but he's probably best known for dragging general aviation away from the old wives' tales and into a more data-driven approach to airplane maintenance. So I consider him, uh, quite simply, America's best-known aviation mechanic. Mike, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. You've been leading a revolution over the last decade or so centered on the concept of reliability-centered maintenance. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, it's been a slow revolution, I must say, uh, because there's an <laughs> awful lot of inertia in, the, in, the, in aviation and particularly in aviation maintenance. But uh, reliability-centered maintenance is, um, I guess very briefly, it's the, it's the, the science of how to do uh, just the right amount of maintenance to uh, accomplish uh, one's goals for safety and reliability, um, but without uh, a lot of excessive cost or excessive downtime. And it was something that was um, pioneered by the airlines uh, back in the late 60s. It was actually developed by a couple of scientists at United Airlines. And um, they, this was just about the time that United was in the process of changing over from recips to, to jets. Most of the airlines were, were starting to fly 707s. United was actually uh, flying DC-8s at the time. And uh, the maintenance was sort of eating them alive on these new airplanes. And, and so they, they uh, tasked a couple of uh, scientists that worked for United um, a guy named Stan Nolan, who was an aer- aeronautical engineer, and a fellow by the name of Howard Heap, who was a, a statistician. And they asked him to, to take a look at how United was doing maintenance and uh, see if they could recommend some ways to make the maintenance process more efficient. Now, the interesting part about this story was that neither uh, Nolan or Heap knew anything about maintenance. So, so they were... <laughs> approaching this, you know, sort of tabula rasa. And they took a lot of notes and they, they kept a lot of statistics. And uh, and the more they looked, the more they were scratching their heads, like, why are we doing it this way? And they ultimately um, developed a this discipline, which they wound up calling reliability-centered maintenance which was just kind of a set of rules for how you create an optimal maintenance program. Um, as I said, it was started at United. It was quickly picked up by the rest of the airlines. Um, um, the project was sort of taken over by the Air Transport Association, which is the alphabet group for the airlines. And um, then the military got interested, and they asked United whether Nolan and Heap could could write a report for the Pentagon, which they did. And, and the, the title of the report was Reliability-Centered Maintenance. Actually, that's the first time I think that term was used. And so it wound up kind of revolutionizing the way the military was doing maintenance in, in aviation. Um, since that time, reliability-centered maintenance has been adopted by all sorts of industries that are outside of aviation. Pretty much anything that's that, that that's uh, maintenance intensive and safety critical um, will benefit from 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 using this approach. So there there are all of these uh, reliability center maintenance consultants around, and they they work on uh, optimizing maintenance for you know 
nuclear reactors and, and water treatment plants and all sorts of stuff that, that isn't aviation involved, but it all started in aviation. And, and it's pretty much the way maintenance is done in almost every segment of aviation, except the, the low end of the food chain where, where we hang out, uh, which is <laughs> owner-flown uh, general aviation. Um, and owner-flown GA, for a bunch of reasons, is mostly still done the same way it was done back in the 50s and 60s. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to accomplish over the last two decades <laughs> is to um, is to tr try to sell this concept to uh, both mechanics and particularly aircraft owners who who really control maintenance you know with their with their credit cards um, to try to do things in a, in a more modern way and to take advantage of some of the lessons that were learned in in the by the airlines and the military in terms of how to do uh, maintenance more efficiently. And a lot of times this gets simplified to, uh, it's about saving money. But I think one of the valuable points you've made over the years is it's not just an economic decision. It, there's the concept of a maintenance-induced failure. I think you've made the uh, analogy before that nobody does preventative open-heart surgery just in yeah. case. And so that's something that some people overlook. Well, that's right? that's one of the things that that Nolan and he discovered in their analysis at United, and, and it was actually something that was the, the earliest case I can find where, where where this principle was discovered was back in in World War II, in in, in uh, with some scientists that that were advising the uh, the Royal Air Force during the war. Um, but but the concept was that maintenance uh, involves risk. Anytime you take something apart and put it back together, there's a chance it doesn't go back together quite right. And so um, the old concept that, that maintenance is good and more maintenance is better is really not correct. Um, there's there there's the right amount of maintenance that that if you do less than that you run into trouble but if you do more than that you can actually be making things less reliable and in fact d during World War II when the RAF started adopting these these principles uh, of reducing the amount of preventive maintenance that was done uh, this this happened to be uh, uh, a bunch of uh, b25 liberators that were the that, that were being maintained these things were hanger queens so half of them were down at any given point in time and they th so they at the recommendation of these scientists they started doing less preventive maintenance and increasing the the preventive maintenance interval and they wound up dramatically increasing force readiness of, of these B-25s. That, that lesson was learned independently again at United Airlines, where, where they found that, that they were grotesquely over-maintaining these, these new airplanes. And when they started to cut back the amount of preventive maintenance that they did, um, the uh, uh, dispatch reliability of the airplanes went up because the, the 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 excessive maintenance was actually doing harm to the airplanes and in in general our ga airplanes uh, unless owners kind of take control of this wind up being over maintained uh, sometimes very badly over maintained um you know if if you if you look in in the maintenance manual for for a piston ga airplane i fly a cessna 310 i've owned it for 32 years or something like that and if i look in the manual it, there's like i don't know 252 separate tasks that i'm supposed to do you know this group every 50 hours this group every 100 hours this group every year and so on and so forth and if i did all of that stuff you know the airplane would never fly and and you know, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I do most of the maintenance myself. But if I had to pay somebody to do it, I couldn't afford to fly the airplane. It it's just it's just way way too much, and it it, it isn't necessary. Um, so you know, one of the basic tenets of liability center maintenance is 
you know, don't do maintenance un unless there's a demonstrable benefit to doing it. Make make, make every maintenance task, you know, pr prove its value before you before you allow it to be done. The second basic principle is don't do things on a calendar. Do things on condition. Um, most of our maintenance manuals call for us to do. Oh, the, a good example that I like to use, uh, which is I think applicable to just about any Cessna from a Cessna 150 to a Citation. But my airplane has three trim tab actuators. Those are these little things that that are driven by a chain on one end and have a, a, a have have a uh, a worm gear in them, and they 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 move the 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 trim tabs. And I have three three trim tabs, rudder, elevator, and aileron. Well, a manual says that I'm supposed to overhaul those trim tab actuators every 200 hours. Well, I, I've flown my airplane now for, I don't know, 4,000 hours. And, and, and so if I did what the book said, I, I would have overhauled them, what, 20 times <laughs> in the time mm -hmm. I've owned the airplane? Well, the number of times I've done it is exactly zero because it didn't need it. So how do I know it didn't need it? Well... It's it's very easy to evaluate whether a trim tab actuator needs work or not. There's two steps involved. Uh, the first step is you climb into the cockpit and you roll the trim wheel all the way to one end of its travel and all the way to the other end of its travel and make sure that it's that that, that it's moving smoothly and it's not hanging up and there's no indication of resistance and that tells you that that the thing doesn't you know doesn't have a lubrication problem. And and then you get out of the cockpit, you go back to the actual trim tab, and you wiggle it, and you measure how much wiggle there is. And the book says there's a certain uh, amount of wiggle that's allowed, and as long as it doesn't wiggle excessively, you know the trim tab actuator isn't excessively worn. So if it passes both of those tests, you know, leave it alone. And it's passed both of those tests for 32 years on my airplane. Now, I'm sure that there's some Cessna somewhere that really needs its trim tab actuators taken apart fairly often. And it's probably a it's it's probably a Cessna 180 on floats up in Alaska that operates off of salt water half of the year and 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 sits in a hangar the other half of the year unflown. And, and that that sort of illustrates the problem with 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 time uh, driven maintenance uh, like what we have in our maintenance manuals. Um, the the uh, when they make up the maintenance manuals and they figure out what these intervals is, the, the intervals have to apply to all the airplanes in the fleet, including the worst case airplane, that Cessna 180 on floats uh, on saltwater. Um, but I don't fly a worst case airplane. Um, but my airplane, you know, sits some distance from the ocean in a, in a, in a hangar and it flies regularly. And so it, it, it doesn't need to be maintained the same way that that worst case airplane is. So that that's why, you know, I strongly encourage people to do things on condition rather than on time. So you mentioned there really a lot of things about maintaining the airplane. Let's turn to the other side, which is operating the airplane as a pilot, which obviously has an impact on maintenance as well. And you wrote in a recent AOPA article, I thought a very short and sweet summation of some advice you've given over the years. And you said, quote, the two keys to piston engine Piston aircraft engine longevity are avoiding extended periods of disuse and managing cylinder head temperatures. So why are those so important? Well, the, the, the first one is probably the most important um, because the principal reason that engines fail to make it to TBO is because of corrosion. Um, it's an unfortunate fact that most general aviation airplanes, unless they're, you know, working airplanes, they they operate in flight school or they they haul cancel checks at night or something like that. But if they're the owner flown airplanes, they tip, typically fly very irregularly, and and they sit around a lot, and that's not good for the for the engines because what protects the engine from Corrosion is is a is an oil film, which is replenished every time you you fly the airplane, 
but but gradually uh, strips off over time when the airplane sits for an extended period of time. So, um, so it, if an, if an engine is 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 going to require overhaul before TBO, it starts making metal, for example. There's there's probably a a, a ninety percent chance that the reason that happened is because of cam and lifter spalling, which is a direct consequence of of corrosion. You you, you start to get corrosion pitting on the cam lobes or the lifter faces, and then as when the engine operates, those pits get get enlarged by mechanical action, and eventually the surface starts coming apart big time, and you wind up with a whole bunch of ferrous metal in the oil filter, and you wind up having to tear down the engine uh, prematurely. So, you know, the best way to make sure that doesn't happen is is to fly the airplane regularly. If you can't fly the airplane regularly, there are some other things that, that, that can be done. There, there are um, engine dehydrators that, that you can, uh, if, if the airplane is somewhere where there's electrical power, you can plug in a dehydrator which which pumps uh, essentially zero humidity air into the crankcase and and displaces all the moisture i mean when whenever we come in from a flight put the airplane away there's a huge amount of moisture in the engine and and, it, and it's not environmental moisture it's 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 because the uh, h2o is one of the two main byproducts of, of the combustion of petroleum the, the other one is carbon dioxide and most of the H2O that's produced as a byproduct of combustion goes out the exhaust in the form of steam, but some of it gets past the rings and winds up in the, uh, you know, in the crankcase, and and it causes uh, you know corrosion if we don't do something about it, and and you can't prevent the formation of water; it's just inherent in in operating the engine. But what you need to do is protect the engine against against corrosion when it's sitting. So. Um, you know, one way is to is is to make sure that the oil film doesn't break down by operating the engine regularly. Another way is to try to purge the moisture out of the engine, which you can do with an engine dehydrator. Um, if you know that the airplane's not going to fly for say more than thirty days or so, then you can do what's called pickling the engine, which is um, putting a special preservative oil in the engine that sticks to the surfaces like glue and doesn't strip off. And then putting uh, desiccant plugs in 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 the cylinders in place of the top spark plugs, and putting some desiccant bags in the induction and exhaust to, to again to try to keep uh, the moisture uh, out of the engine and uh, and prevent it from corroding. But but corrosion is the biggest uh, engine killer that we have, um, and and it's. But it particularly afflicts owner flow and GA because we just don't fly enough. And I know with my own airplane, you know, I, I fly it in fits and starts. I just, I just came back from the East Coast. You know, I flew the airplane to to Richmond, Virginia, for a conference, and I flew it up to Boston to visit my sister. And so I, I put quite a bit of time on it. And particularly coming back because the headwinds were just horrible. <laughs> but um, but then you know sometimes it'll it'll sit for a month. And, and I don't fly it, and I know that's that's not good for the airplane, but that's just kind of the way life is. And you know, if if we treated our cars that way, we would have corrosion problems in our in our car engines. But we typically don't. We typically drive our cars every day or two, or, but we don't fly our airplanes the same way. And on CHTs, I know there's all kinds of you know uh, rigorous pilot debates that go on. But in your opinion. How hot is too hot if I'm flying? I know your advice maybe varies like homing continental, but from a high level, how hot is too hot? Um, well, I, I mean, I have some guidelines that, 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 that I use and that, that I offer, and they're not particularly magic numbers. Uh, first of all, the manufacturers provide a CHT red line, but it's kind of a ridiculously high red line, and... Uh, for most continental engines, the, the CHT red line is 460 Fahrenheit. For most Lycomings, it's 500. Um, we don't ever want to operate at cylinder head temperatures anywhere near that hot. Um, the the 
that's that's a red line at, at, at which you start to compromise the the metallurgy of the cylinder um and in fact i i have a a wonderful engine monitor capture that I, that i i grabbed a few years ago from a client that was flying a cirrus sr22 down in florida and and he had a a, a detonation event that went on in one cylinder that he, that he didn't notice. I, I'm not sure why, because, you know, the Cirrus is instrumented up the yin-yang, but he didn't notice it. And so the CHT on this one cylinder majestically climbed uh, over a period of about uh, 15 minutes um, up through 400, up through 420, up through 440. Um, 460 was the red line, and it it got to 466 degrees and and the head separated from the barrel <laughs> so wow. so that that sort of indicated that maybe that maybe that 460 is <laughs> kind of you know you, you really don't want to go that high um lycomings have a have a higher cht red line because they the cylinders are, are are built to take somewhat more heat and we've got um we've done some research we've got a the, the world's largest database of engine monitor data. We've we've got uh, I don't know three and a half million GA flights in there, and so we did some research on CHTs on Continentals and Lycomings, and um, the, the Lycomings generally run about twenty degrees hotter in CHTs and Continentals, and chiefly because of their sodium-filled exhaust valves, which do a better job of transferring the heat from the valve to the to the head, so we see it in, in in the form of increased CHT. But so, you know, generally speaking, I I I urge pilots to try to keep their CHTs below 400 Fahrenheit if it's a continental cylinder, or 420 if it's a Lycoming. It, it's not a bad idea to 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 shoot for something about 20 degrees lower than that so you have a little bit of buffer it's not that any you know that anything's going to fly apart if the CHT gets above 400 we, we sort of know where things are going to fly apart but 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 it's it's it, it it's just um a higher CHT is is uh, indicative of of greater stress on all the reciprocating components and um, if if you can religiously maintain your CHTs at a, at a reasonable level, then you're guaranteed not to get into the, the detonation territory and and and, and cause uh, damage. Um, there's also such a thing as as too low CHTs. Um, the 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 problem with running CHTs too low. Is that if they get low enough, um, the lead scavenging agent in our in our hundred low lead av gas, the ethylene dibromide, can't really do its job of scavenging lead um, and, and and turning it into a gas so it goes harmlessly out the exhaust. And so what happens is you, we start getting um, lead uh, deposits, lead bromide deposits on various combustion chamber components spark plugs and stuff but the the most harmful is that it, it starts collecting on the exhaust valve stem and will can lead to sticking valves particularly in lycomings where sticking valves is a is a significant problem again because of the sodium filled exhaust valves that they that they use so ideally we want to keep cylinder head temperatures you know kind of in the sweet spot uh, say uh, for continentals maybe 310 or 320 on the bottom side and 380 to 400 on the top side but anywhere in that range is 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 a pretty healthy place to be and for lycomings uh, you know I'd sort of increase all of that by about 20 20 degrees um but that's what we should shoot for and again they're they're not they're not magic numbers. They're just intended to be sort of guidelines as to what people ought to shoot for. Unfortunately, our CHT gauges aren't marked that way. They 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 have a green arc that goes all the way up to the red line. <laughs> but I I like to urge you know pilots to kind of develop their own personal 
uh, color code or, 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 or mental, you know, green arc and mental yellow arc uh, on the gauge that they at least imagine was there and, and try to try to manage the, the temperatures that way. All right, Mike, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more questions. Buying an airplane or outfitting your hangar? Sporties has everything you need to keep your gear organized and your airplane running smoothly. From chocks and sunshades to oil and oil filters, count on Sporties for the guaranteed lowest prices and same-day shipping. Shop the complete selection at sporties.com. Now, back to John Zimmerman and Pilot's Discretion. Mike, another very hot topic, no pun intended, when it comes to pilot operation is lean of peak, the, the debate that won't die, as I have called it. Uh, why do you think it is, after all these years of debating it, and many people, including you, providing some very detailed data-driven arguments in favor of it, why do you think this holds on, and what does it tell us about GA culture and some of our inherent conservatism? Well, I... I'm a proponent of Lena Peak operation. It's the way I've operated my airplane for decades. It's very obvious to me what the benefits are. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the one of the benefits, of course, is is better fuel economy. But the the real big benefit is if 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 you if you take a look inside a cylinder with a bore scope, which I recommend doing on a regular basis, um, you can always tell instantaneously how that cylinder was operated, whether it was operated lean or peak or, or rigid peak, because if it, if, if it was operated lean or peak, the, the combustion chamber tends to be very clean with minimal deposits. And if it's operated rigid peak, it, there, there tends to be a lot of crud built up in, in, inside. Um, the, the, I mean, there there, there are some good reasons for for running Richard Peak sometimes. Um, for example, I, I mostly run Richard Peak in climbs, although not always. Um, the if you're looking for maximum power or maximum speed, you you'll get it operating Richard Peak. Uh, if 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 you're you know flying at Reno, you're not going to be operating Lena Peak <laughs> during the race. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the and and the the other the other issue is that is that some engines um, aren't really happy running Lena Peak because their mixture distribution isn't good enough, and most uh, well, pretty much all uh, injected engines. Uh, can run lean to peak if 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 the fuel nozzles are tuned to to provide good mixture distribution. With carbureted engines, um, most carbureted Lycomings will run pretty well lean to peak. They're, they, you can't take them as far lean to peak as you could with an injected engine, but the 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 Lycoming carbureted engines have a pretty symmetric induction system, with the carburetor sitting on the bottom of the engine and and the induction tubes coming up kind of like a spider. And so they inherently have fairly even mixture distribution, which allows them to, to, to operate lean and peak fairly well. Uh, some of the carbureted Continentals are a real challenge, particularly like the 0470 series and the Cessna 182 and so on, where the, the carburetor is mounted way in the, in the back of the engine and the, um, and the fuel air mixture has to run forward uh, along horizontal runners that, that break off into risers, feeding the cylinders from back to front. And and that scheme inherently provides poor mixture distribution. The rear cylinders always run lean and the front cylinders always run rich. And so it can be difficult to run those engines lean to peak without getting unacceptable roughness. Uh, I've got a, quite a lot of time in sky lanes, and there are some tricks you can use to improve the mixture distribution. But it's it's a challenging engine to operate lean a peak. But you know, it, if 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 you if you want to go fast, uh, rich a peak is the is is the, the way to go. If if you want to go efficient and clean, lean a peak is advantageous. I tend to be more interested in 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 engine longevity and. Uh, um, 
and efficiency than, than I do with, with, with getting, wringing the last knot out of the airplane, but other people are, are different. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's a place for, for both of them. I, I do think that, that the engine will last longer if it's operated clean a peak, which is sort of contrary to what a lot of mechanics will tell you. Um, b because if, if you look at the, at the, the pressure pulses, uh, when you're operating lean of peak, the, the, the pulses are, are broader and less peaky and there's just less stress on the reciprocating components. It just, it's sort of a kinder, gentler combustion. You know, what always, you know, sort of amuses me is, uh, these A and P's that, that, that blame all engine ills on running Lena Peak and warn their their clients that that that's that the worst thing they can possibly do, and 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 then at five o'clock they jump into their Toyota pickup truck and drive home, and their Toyota pickup truck is obviously running way Lena Peak because if it didn't, it couldn't pass the smog <laughs> test, you know. But but boy, if you do that with an aircraft engine, all you know terrible things are going to happen. It's it's an old wives' tale, um, and it's you know, it's. It's gradually getting more and more accepted, but there's just a lot of inertia in, in aviation. People don't like to change things. It makes it, it worries them. Um, manufacturers don't like to change things because their 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 lawyers are always on top of them to 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 be super conservative. And it, it's it's just a it's a it's a hard field to. To, to get to change. So you have to have a lot of patience. All right, Mike, at the end of every one of these episodes, we do a segment called Ready to Copy, where I throw out some questions and you give me your quick answer. And I could probably do this all day with you because I have <laughs> dozens of them, but I'll try to restrict myself to uh, maybe six or eight here. So are you ready to copy? I am. Should pilots be more involved in their maintenance, either doing their own oil changes or participating in an annual with, uh, with their A&P? Is that a good idea or a bad it's a, idea? It's a great idea. Um, and, and not only will owners um, be more satisfied with their maintenance if they're in, in, involved in it and involved in the decision-making process, but invariably they will wind up with better maintained airplanes that way. Do mechanics like it when owners are involved like that, or are they secretly annoyed by having the owner looking over their shoulder? It varies all over the place. Uh, some some mechanics are, are are very happy to to work with owners and feel that that an educated owner is 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 are, are the best ones and and like to teach their clients to to be smarter about maintenance and. Uh, other other mechanics consider them an annoyance and say, "Why don't you go away and let me do my job?" And and so there's there's I, I can't give you a blanket answer to that. It varies all over the place. How about a little myth busting here? Is it okay for me to operate an airplane engine over square? That is manifold pressure at twenty four inches and RPM at twenty three inches. Is the thing going to come apart if I do no, that? No, it's absolutely the best thing you can do. And the 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 the, the guy who who, who was most responsible for teaching us that was Charles Lindbergh, who who uh, who, who taught the military how, how to fly their transports across the ocean uh, by operating uh, extremely over square. They were all convinced that the engines would come apart. Of course, they they didn't, and Charles Lindbergh was right. And um, <laughs> I, I've I've written some articles about that, and 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 publish some, some of the charts that, that Continental and Lycoming have in their operator's manuals that most pilots never even look at because they, they have a POH, but they never get the, the manual from, from the engine manufacturer. But it shows what, what the acceptable operating envelope is, and um, the, most Continentals can, can uh, normally aspirated Continentals can be operated, you know, two or three inches over square uh, with Continental's blessing and Lycoming's are more like four to six inches over square. And of course our turbocharge engines run hugely over square. I mean, I typically, when I'm typically operating my, my Cessna 310, which has got a couple of turbocharged Continentals, I'm always running 10 or 11 inches over square. So th I was taught the same thing by my flight instructor back in the sixties that you know that if you if you ever go over square, everything's going to fly apart, and it's just not true. 
There are a lot of oil additives out there. Some have come and gone. Are these all snake oil or some of these actually provide benefits for owners? Um, some of them are harmful. Some of them are, are, are okay, but uh, the, they don't seem to do very much. Uh, the, the one that, that I think is, is quite good and that I use in my airplane is, is a product called ASL CamGuard which its its main claim to fame is that it, it 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 it's the best corrosion preventative additive package that I think is is available and I mentioned earlier you know in the podcast that corrosion is the is is a huge enemy um we when Ablen first came out we did some we did some some tests in in some twins where we treated one engine and not the other and we could never tell the difference in the oil analysis figures so i don't think it does any harm and if it gives you a warm glowy feeling throw it in there uh <laughs> the only ones that i that i feel that 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 i really discourage people from using is 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 anything that has teflon in it um, because Teflon has the, uh, ha, there's a phenomenon called Teflon flocking where the little, the, the little things of, uh, I forget what the chemical name for Teflon is. It's a long name, but, but they, they, they can stick together and they can start clogging up small passages like in hydraulic lifters and so on. So it's not a good idea to use anything, any additive that has Teflon in it, but, uh, um, the only one that I use on a routine basis and recommend is uh, is CamGuard as a corrosion preventative primarily. A lot of press recently about Gammy's new uh, unleaded avgas option. Is that a big deal, you think, or is that not the answer we've been waiting for? Well, I mean, I I, I think it's a big deal, but the you know the real question is 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 how to deploy it, and I think that's very complicated. Um. And um, it, it's just hard to predict uh, what what a rollout of that fuel is going to look like. Or uh, fuel distributors probably not going to be interested in carrying both hundred low lead and 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 uh, G one hundred UL. And you know some airplanes, at least for some period of time, won't won't, won't be eligible for the. G100 ULSTC. So it's a very complicated situation. The logistics of rolling it out are are are, are complex. But I, I must say, um, I, I can't wait until we uh, can operate our engines on unleaded fuel. I think lead does a tremendous amount of harm, and and it's responsible for an awful lot of ills. Uh, and the quicker we can we can get off of the lead uh, the better and you know a real good example of that is the is the rotex 900 series engines which were really designed to run on unleaded mo gas but are allowed to run on 100 low lead but if you run them on 100 low lead all the maintenance intervals get cut in half and and you know you have to take the gearbox apart a lot more often and stuff because the, the 100 low lead just you know is 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 not really healthy for the engine it's authorized but it it's uh it's it's much much better to operate on unleaded fuel so anybody anybody that has the ability to run on unleaded gas i would certainly recommend doing it for the average pilot doing a pre-flight inspection on their airplane they're not a mechanic but what's one thing they could pay more attention to or do a better job of inspecting that would Make their flying safer or help their airplane longevity. Well, I'm I'm, I'm going to answer that question in a, in a, in a funny way. Um, I I, th I think the best thing that pilots can do in terms of pre-flight <laughs> is to do their own oil changes, <laughs> because um, you know there are a few airplanes like Bonanzas that that have big barn doors on the side of the cowling where you can actually see something during pre-flight. An awful lot of our airplanes, uh, you know, the, the, all all we can do is is open the door and make sure that the oil cap is secure. We can't really see very much without taking the cowling off. So I really like to see owners do their own oil changes because it gives them an opportunity to to decal the engine and actually get a look at it and see whether there's 
you know, any exhaust leaks, any, any flammable fluid leaks, anything chafing or burning or, you know, all the things that you'd like to look for in pre-flight, except that, that in most airplanes, you can't see it without taking the cowling off. So I, I sort of consider an owner performed oil changes at advanced pre-flight. Fair enough. All right, Mike, our last question on these podcast episodes is always the same one. You have one final flight, and we want to know, what are you flying, and where are you going? Oh, my. Well, you know, I, when I think back over the flying I've done, I think probably the most enjoyable trip I ever took, and this was back about 1990, uh, was I when I took a month off and flew the 310 up to Alaska. And I would love to do that one one more time it, it 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 was an absolute gas and alaska is huge and scenic and very very aviation oriented i mean the 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 state couldn't have been opened up without general aviation and there's just uh, an awful lot of wonderful things to see up there so i think maybe that might be the what might be the flight mike bush thanks for being on the podcast oh my pleasure Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties Pilot Shop. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. And if you have comments or guest ideas, email podcast at sporties.com. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion. Pilot's Discretion.